Hi, everyone. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. I want to make sure we have enough time to answer all of your questions at the end. Thank you so much for joining us today um, for important student loan updates and what you can expect in 2023. My name is Katie Caresco. I'm the Targeted Outreach Specialist for the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation, which we'll refer to as DFPI. Slide, please. Thank you. Um, before we hear from our awesome speaker, I have some important information about today's webinar for you to keep in mind. Uh, throughout the entire webinar, your video, microphone, and chat feature will be turned off. And since this event is being recorded, it will be available to you on our YouTube channel, which we'll post a little bit later. Um, and it will also be emailed to you along with all of the slides. So don't feel like you have to jot everything down. Um, hopefully that will be done later today or tomorrow. If you have any questions during the webinar, please add them to the Q&A feature. And if it isn't answered by our team of experts right away, we'll try our best to get to it live um, during our Q&A session towards the end. You can also save your question until we get to that time as well and we'll answer it live. And today's topics are going to include um, public service loan forgiveness, the one-time IDR adjustment, the Fresh Start program, borrower rights, and also some extra resources. So now I'm happy to introduce today's speaker, Selena Damien, the DFPI student loan ombudsperson. Selena, please take it away. Thank you, Katie. Sure. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we are very happy that you are here to hear about this important information. Um, I think um, unlike everything else that we are hearing about with the, all the, um, the legal challenges, Supreme Court decision that we're waiting on, um, these programs that we're talking about today are not being challenged legally. And on the other hand, there's improvements that are being made to the programs to benefit borrowers. So I'm glad that you are here today to hear about the initiatives and how you can benefit and take advantage of them. Um, first of all, just briefly, what are some of our responsibilities as the California's as California's Consumer Protection Agency? We regulate companies of financial products to ensure compliance, and that includes student loan servicers. We investigate consumer complaints. We take legal actions when these companies are not in compliance. We conduct education and outreach to enhance consumer awareness with the ultimate goal of protecting consumers from fraud and abuse. Next, please. A little bit about the student loan debt amounts. In the United States, borrowers owe $1.75 trillion of student loan debt. Um, because of the cost of rising cost of education, the um, decrease of financial aid amounts, and just more people accessing higher education and going to school, student loan debt has increased nearly 150% from 2008 to 2019. Student loan debt is now second behind mortgages and consumer debt in the nation. In California, 4 million borrowers owe $141 billion of student loan debt. Most of that debt is federal student loan debt. And in 2019 and 2020, 46% of California college graduates had student loan debt. The average debt load of a California borrower is $37,000. And although not at the highest in the nation, the default rate in California is 7.1%. So a borrower with federal student loans goes into default after not paying 270 days. So that is what we are trying to avoid when we have student loan debt. Next, please. So before we get into the updates and just to help you understand uh, some of the things I will be talking about, I just want to briefly go over the difference between federal and private loans and then the difference between lenders and servicers. Um, a federal loans are student loans that are made and funded directly by the US Department of Education or ED. 
through the William D. Ford Federal Direct Loan Program. So any loans dispersed after 2010 are going to be direct loans. Um, with federal loans, interest rates are fixed and set by Congress and typically lower than private loans. No credit check is required to obtain the loans except for parent plus loans. And your federal loans are going to be either subsidized or unsubsidized, which means that the interest is accruing from the time of disbursement or the time the interest starts accruing once you're done with school. So that is the difference between subsidized and unsubsidized, but it's going to be basically the same federal loan. For private loans, those are ones that are made by the lender, such as a bank, a credit union, a state agency, or even a school. Private loans do not, do not offer the same flexible repayment terms and or forgiveness options as federal loans do. So everything that we are talking about today applies to federal loans only. So to obtain a private loan, um, you often uh, need an established credit record and a co-signer and a borrower may be able to take have higher limits or they have higher limits for private loans. So sometimes borrowers will see that they have a mix of federal and private loans. And then also important to understand the difference between a lender and a servicer. The lender is the company or the organization that's lending you the money. So they originate the loan. For federal loans, Ed or Department of Education is the lender. For private loans, it's going to be your banks, your Discover, Chase, uh, Sally Mae. Uh, so those are going to be the lenders. And then student loan servicers. Now, servicers are the main point of contact for the student. So the student loan servicer is a company that tracks the loans while a borrower is in school. They send the borrower their bill every month and they process the payments. They're also going to be processing changes in payment plans. They will be um, accepting applications for forgiveness, um, deferments, and forbearances. So a borrower may have more than one servicer throughout the, the, the life of the loan. Currently, there are five uh, federal student loan servicers, um, and it's very important that a borrower, before they get started with trying to identify what plan is best for them, repayment plan, forgiveness plan, that they identify who their servicer is. That's going to be very, very important because that's who will be providing them the information when they call to make changes or inquire about any of these benefits. Next, please. Oh, and one thing I didn't mention about federal private loans, or I forgot to mention quickly, if you do have federal loans and you decide to refinance into a private loan, you cannot revert back to a federal loan. So when you're making that change, just be very careful to understand the terms of um, those changes that you're making. Okay, so now we're going to get into our first um, program that I want to talk about. Many of you probably have already heard of PSLF for the Public Service Loan Forgiveness. So PSLF was created in 2007 to encourage individuals to enter and remain in public service. Under the program, forgiveness is granted after satisfying certain criteria for 10 years. Um, in 2021, a waiver was created, the PSLF waiver, to help borrowers apply and benefit for the program. So what happened was in 2017, between 2017 and 2019, when the first cohort of borrowers applied for PSLF, there was a 90, almost 99% denial rate because the program was not being administered properly, servicers weren't tracking correctly, and borrowers were not receiving the proper information about what loans qualified. So there was a lot of confusion. So they created the waiver and the waiver ended October 31st of last year. Um, as of March of this year, 41, almost 42,000 Californians have received nearly $3 billion in PSLF. And so the reason why I want to talk about this is because even though the waiver ended, the program has not ended and some of the waiver benefits have been extended essentially through the ITR adjustment, which we will talk about next. So for even though the if borrowers weren't able to benefit or apply prior to October 31st of last year, but they're still working in public service, they may still have be able to benefit from some of um, these changes that are being implemented. Next, please. 
So the PSLF requirements are that you have to have a federal loan. Again, private loans do not qualify. You must have a direct loan. It can be subsidized or unsubsidized. Direct PLUS loans qualify whether they're grad PLUS loans. Parent PLUS loans will need to consolidate to be eligible for an IDR plan as that what that is one of the requirements. So a borrower that has a parent PLUS loan can consolidate into a direct consolidation loan. However, they will only be eligible for one of the income-driven repayment plans. So just make sure um, you understand what the payment amount will be. And you can do that through the studentaid.gov website. But pretty much any direct loan is eligible. Um, the ones that are not eligible are the family, federal family education loans or FEL loans, defaulted direct loans, and as I said, private loans. The way that you can make a FEL loan eligible is by consolidating into a direct loan. So for borrowers that have these pre-2010 loans, they can consolidate without losing their account. Now, this was one of the benefits of the PSLF waiver that is being extended through the income-driven repayment or IDR adjustment. So that is one of, so borrowers are still able to consolidate the FEL loans into direct loans without losing count. So that benefit has been extended through 2023. And then your employment. So it has to be paid employment. Volunteer work does not count. Internships do not count. Fellowships count if they are paid. Um, a borrower must be employed, W-2 employee, by a government organization at any level. It can be federal, city, county, municipal, military work counts as uh, government work, or they can be an employee at a 501c3 nonprofit organization. You must work what the employer defines as full-time or at least 30 hours per week. And what's super important to note about PSLF, and I get this question a lot, is that it does not matter what you do for the organization. It matters who you work for. So it doesn't matter if you're in clerical and maintenance, in uh, research, in IT, if you're an attorney, a teacher, any position, as long as your W-2 or your employer is a qualifying employer, you qual it's considered qualifying. Next, please. And then the repayment plan. So a borrower must be under an income-driven repayment plan, and it can be any of the IDR plans. As I mentioned, if you have a parent plus zone and you consolidated, you are only eligible for one of the IDR plans. So it's just important to understand that when you're doing a consolidation with the parent plus loan. And another thing to note is depending on the income and the amount that you owe, the payment may increase under these plans and the PSLF may not be the best option. So this is since income driven repayment plan is a plan that is based on a borrower's income. If a borrower has a higher income and has a lower student loan debt balance, then an IDR plan may not be um, it may not be advisable because the pay, the loan is going to be paid off in less than 10 years. So it just may not be the best option. Um, and again, that's going to depend on a borrower's uh, on a case by case basis. And then qualifying payments. So 100, a borrower has to make 120 payments. These borrow, these payments do not have to be consecutive. So if you take a leave of absence, or if you decide that you uh, a borrower goes into private sector for a few years and comes back, they can pick up right where they left off. A borrower can make can prepay or make a lump sum payment for up to 12 months or when the next IDR certification is due as long as they certify that full period. So if you want to make um, a year's worth of payments ahead of time, it will count towards PSLF as long as the payment, the months were qualified. Um, and then one thing that's very important is that all these months, almost over 36 months of the CARES Act forbearance or the payment pause count towards PSLF. So that's over, if you were employed, that's over three years of PSLF credit where you have not had to make a payment and you will be receiving credit. Therefore, you will only need to make payments for really seven years under the 10-year um, the requirement. Next, please. 
So getting started, um, you need to find out if your employer is a qualified public service employer. FSA or on studentaid.gov, they have an employer eligibility search tool that you can use to look up your employer. You will need the federal employee ID number, which is typically on, in the, on the W-2 form, but you can also Google that information. You do need to find out what type of loans you have. Um, you log on to your studentaid.gov account. You can look up on your um, landing page, and you can see you can see if it's a direct loan, a direct subsidized, direct um, unsubsidized, direct consolidation. You will see DLC, DLS, or um, DLUS. But you can download download all your aid data, and then you will see if you have any of these older fell loans. If you need to consolidate, and really one of the easiest ways to know is if you were part of the COVID uh, payment pause or the forbearance, then you know that you have direct loans. If you had to continue paying during the pause, then you most likely have fell loans. If you paid voluntarily, well, then that's you probably you want to double check, but you most likely have direct loans. So if you had to make payments during the pause, you most likely do have to take some action as far as consolidating to consolidate them into direct loans and then apply for the program. Um, Consolidations can be done on studentaid.gov as well. Um, there's information there. Uh, you, you can do it automatically or you can print the application to consolidate. Um, now, you do have to consolidate before the end of 2023 in order to not lose your count um, or not reset your count. Under typical, under normal PSLF rules, when you consolidate from a, any loan into a direct loan, a fell loan into a direct loan, your count is reset. So right now, we are still in a period where they are not resetting and they are taking the count for the oldest loan similar what they were doing for the PSLF waiver. And then you submit your employer certification form. So your certification form, there's one, it's the same one to apply initially for PSLF to certify the employee and to certify the employment. They, the applications can now be submitted electronically. This is something that happened within the last two or three months where before you had to print out the application and send it to the employer or email it, scan it. Now you can fill out the application through the PSLF help tool. You can enter the employer's email, which you will need, or the contact person's email, and they will automatically receive the document through DocuSign. So it makes the process a lot easier. It will make certification a lot easier for everyone now since scanning and printing it, it has become a little bit more challenging. So this is a new function that will hopefully help streamline the process. Now, Mojila is the PSLF servicer. So if you do apply for PSLF for the first time, you will be automatically transferred to Mojila. And as of today, Mojila has fully processed all the PSLF backlog prior to the waiver. So anything that any applications that they've received prior to October 31st have already been processed and now they're working on all the new applications. Next, please. So here is a copy of the PSLF, um, the certification form. Like I said, it's the same for new, um, new applicants. And if you are, um, just recertifying. So now, as I said, everything can be done online and you can just send it automatically through DocuNet, fill it out, which is a lot easier. But in case that you don't want to use that function, you're, you're still going to have the option to print and um, just make sure that this is legible. Make sure that you have um, the, the person is the person that is authorized to certify employment and just follow the instructions. It's very simple two page form, but we still do get some denials and returns because people don't um, follow the instructions. So FEIN is going to be very important. If you are a state of California employee, we all have the same FEIN number. There's a, a number that it's dedicated to each agency, but we are using the main one on our um, W-2 form. Next, please. Oh, okay. So some takeaways from for PSLF today. So 
as I said, if you miss the waiver and you, you can still benefit. So the only difference between the waiver and what's happening right now in conjunction with the IDR adjustment is that you still have to be employed. So during the waiver period, you did not have to be employed. So that helped borrowers, benefited borrowers that were retired possibly or had already uh, moved out of public service, but did the 10 years. So now you still have to be employed and you can, but you can still consolidate without resetting the account, which is a very important benefit for um, during this time. And you have to consolidate before the end of 2023. Again, they will take the count for the oldest loan. If you are new to public service, you can apply and start tracking your process. Your process. So that's very important. You don't want to wait until you're in five, six years and have changed multiple employers and then certify and then find out you have issues. So it's very important that you start tracking your progress. So maybe one or two years in, and then you will have to consolidate on, uh, excuse me, you will have to certify on a yearly basis. Um, during this whole process, there's been some confusing correspondence from Mojila, from student aid, .gov, from even a previous servicer, if you're a new uh, PSLF um, applicant. So you may receive correspondence with different counts, but it is not necessarily the final count. So it's very important just to be patient. Sometimes you will get um, correspondence from Mojila saying if you just consolidated or that's saying that you've only that you only have two qualifying counts and that scares people, right? Um, it, it, so then they'll email me and they'll say what's going on. So I just tell them just give it a few months, a few weeks, because there are a few adjustments that are going on and they do need to receive information from Ed in order to actually process all the, the counts. And now they're track, they're processing forbearance and deferment periods on top of that. So there will be some changes to the number. So if you get your, you receive your first letter and it doesn't sound right, just you most likely will get a second letter with the correct count. Now, if it's a few months and, and the count just hasn't changed, then you can contact us or you can contact FSA to file a complaint. Um, PSLF is non-taxable under federal and now state law through 2025. So if you receive PSLF forgiveness, it will not count as income. Um, so there are some permanent PSLF improvements through these new guidelines that will take effect July 1st. Um, this is going to make the PSLF process just easier. It's going to reduce the barriers that have typically hindered people from applying and being granted forgiveness through PSLF. So um, Ed is adopting a single standard of full-time employee at 30 hours a week. They are now changing the way they calculate credit for adjunct facilities and professors in college or um, higher education professionals. Um, and then they're going to be counting certain periods in deferment or forbearance towards PSLF, including cancer, military, post -active, and post-active duty student deferment, which they did not before. So this is going to give borrowers um, additional credit. And then they're going to formalize a reconsideration process for borrowers to have their applications reviewed again if there are errors made. So they're in addition to the, they're formalizing not just the initial cons reconsideration process or appeal process, but then they're at, they're going to do an additional review, which is, again, it's going to take time. These will start July 1st but they are improvements that are being made for borrowers to obtain forgiveness and get enrolled in the program easier. So these were all the, all the things that were causing that 99, 98% denial rate. And as you can see, we've already, um, many borrowers have already received forgiveness. There are still many to go. So I think the main, um, the main uh, what's important to remember is that if you miss your waiver, go ahead and, and um, apply read up on the information, ask us questions, and then you can decide if it's the best for you, but there are really great benefits. And then the one-time IDR adjustment may increase your PSLF count. So this is what I will be talking about. Next slide, please. So again, similar to the PSLF waiver, um, Department of Education is conducting a one-time income-driven repayment adjustment. So under income-driven repayment, there is a forgiveness component to it. So an IDR plan bases your monthly payment on your income and your family size. If you repay your loans under an IDR plan, 
any remaining balance on your student loan is forgiven after you make a certain number of payments over 20 or 25 years. So as you can see, depending on the type of loan and the borrower, it's going to be either the 25 years or the 240 months of payments, and that's when you are eligible for repayment. So PLUS loans for parents, um, more consoli consolidation loans that include a plus loan for parents. If you pay under an IDR plan for 25 years or 300 months of payments, you are granted forgiveness. Borrowers with only undergrad loans, 20 years. Borrowers with grad loans and currently enrolled in pay a repayment plan, 20 years. And then borrowers with graduate loans and not currently enrolled in pay repayment plan, 25 years. So you still have to be enrolled in the other ones, but if you're enrolled in the pay, it makes, that's what makes the difference. So um, any under the adjustment, any borrowers with loans that have accumulated eligible time and repayment of at least 20 or 25 years will see automatic forgiveness, even if they are not currently on an IDR plan. So the reason they're doing this is again, because of a longstanding history of not tracking properly, um, mismanagement of the program and forbearance steering where borrowers were placed in forbearance in violation of ed rules, even when their monthly payment could have been zero. Um, instead of processing their, uh, advising them to get on an IDR plan to qualify benefit from this forgiveness program, they were just placing them on, um, on forbearance, which was actually increasing their loan, uh, loan balance and causing borrowers to go into um, default. So they are conducting this adjustment and it is something that you can benefit from through the end of the year. Next, please. So the adjustment, what are they doing? They are conducting a review of every borrower's account and they are giving borrowers credit for any months in repayment status, regardless of the payments made, the loan type or the repayment plan. They are giving borrowers credit for 12 or more months of consecutive forbearance or 36 or more months of cumulative forbearance. They are giving credit for any month spent in economic hardship or military deferment in 2013 or later, any month spent in deferment prior to 2013 with the exception of in-school deferment, and any time in repayment on earlier loans before consolidation of those loans into a consolidation loan. Next, please. And then who is eligible? So by, by doing that, adjustment, what they are doing is they are filling in those gaps. So if people have 20, 25 years of payment history, but there's gaps in between where they were in forbearance and deferment for whatever reason, or maybe they got they didn't certify for an IDR plan and then they were thrown into a standard plan and then they recertified. So they're basically giving credit and filling in those gaps. So this is a very important benefit that's going to apply to well, everyone going forward, they're fixing the IDR of forgiveness plan, but right now, um, mostly the borrowers that have been paying for long periods of time, and they are not, this does not have a employment requirement. So that's where this is different from PSLF, also very beneficial. So who is eligible? So a borrower that has, has at least one direct loan, including Parent PLUS loan or one FELL program loan held by Ed. So borrowers with commercially managed FELL, Perkins, or HEAL program loans should apply for a direct consolidation loan by the end of 2023. So again, this is similar to the waiver where you will not lose, you will not, re the count will not reset. What they will be doing is they will be, you will be consolidating and the count with the loan with the longest count will be the loan that will be your count. So that will get you closer to the 20 or 25 years. So a borrower that has these type of loans should apply for direct consolidation. But they have until the end of 2023. Um, borrowers with loans in default can benefit by getting out of default, including through the Fresh Start initiative. So there's a few ways to get out of default. I will be talking about Fresh Start after the IDR adjustment. Um, Ed will make the adjustment and will credit certain payments or months toward loan forgiveness if you are an ID, on an IDR plan or were in the past, if you are in public service loan forgiveness program, if you are not on an IDR plan but are interested and have director of FELL program loans, 
um, you will have to enroll on an IDR plan moving forward. So right as of right now, they are giving credit for any payment plan that you're under, but let's say you don't meet the 20 to 25 years, the threshold for forgiveness, you want to get yourself on an IDR plan. So moving forward, let's say you're on 15, 17 years. So moving forward, you can um, continue accruing um, eligible months for IDR forgiveness. And the reason why it mentions PSLF is because again, let's say a borrower has eight years of PSLF um, qualifying months, and then there's gaps in there where they have forbearment for forbearance or deferment. This IDR adjustment is going to fill in those gaps and give them credit and bring them closer to um, PSLF. So I've already seen that happen with borrowers where they where they get a count and then they. Um, somehow end up getting, um, they'll have their PSLF count and then they'll get an updated count with months where they didn't really understand where they came from. And it's probably from, uh, most likely from this adjustment that they've been doing to try to get, they're trying to get as many people forgiven out of the system as possible and as, uh, as fast as they can as well. Next, please. So how does it work? So they will go and they will credit periods back to July 1st, 1994, which is the start of the IDR program. So they will review every borrower, borrower account that has at least one direct loan or one fell program loan. Those are the qualifying loans. If you need to consolidate, then you will need to do the consolidation. They will first review the loans that have been in repayment long enough to qualify for IDR forgiveness. So these are borrowers that have been in repayment 20 or 25 years. And then they will review all other loans. So they've already started doing the adjustment, the reviews for those borrowers in the 20, 25 year bracket. And they expect to start the other adjustment um, early next year. Again, these dates may change, but borrowers do have until the end of the year to get themselves basically on an IDR plan or cons consolidation if they need to. Again, these CARES Act, these 36 months or over 36 months, three years, these months are counting towards IDR adjustment as well. So Ed will identify the payments to be counted and they will instruct the servicer to make the one-time update. So the information is coming directly from Department of Education. So right now, if you call your servicer and ask them if you have IDR qualifying months, unfortunately, they will not be able to tell you and Ed will not be able to tell you either at this time because they are um, expecting to finish this probably next year. So if you, the only way to really know is just make sure you're on a, you have the correct loan, you've been making your payments for the amount of time. And then if you have those periods of, of forbearance deferment or on a non-IDR plan, just expect those to be um, added at some point next year. No action is needed. If you are eligible, like I said, just make sure you have all the, um, you know, you qualify and then you will be contacted by Ed and have the chance to opt out as some borrowers um, don't want the forgiveness for some reason or, or another, but they are giving borrowers that chance. Um, if a borrower made qualifying payments that exceed the applicable 2025 20, years, they may receive a refund for their overpayment. So it just depends if you consolidated, if you made those payments on the direct qualifying loan, to, similar to the PSLF waiver. And then FSA will be introducing an IDR tracker similar to the PSLF tracker um, on the studentaid.gov site. So now borrowers moving forward, once they do implement this or install this tracker, you will be able to see where you are with your payments moving forward. So if you're not at the 20 or 25 years yet, but you are close and you want to benefit from this program, then you want to get yourself on an IDR plan. And then um, it, within the next few years, you will be able to track that progress similar to PSLF. Next, please. So that was the IDR. Now we are talking about the Fresh Start program. So how Fresh Start program is a program for borrowers that are in default. So there are 7.5 million borrowers with defaulted federal student loans. Um, now the impact of being in default are, there's some negative consequences to being in default. You can get your wages um, withheld, credit reporting um, consequences. You can have wages, wages garnished, social security benefits 
garnish, tax payments, garnish. So you want to avoid default at any cost. However, if you are in default, were in default prior to the start of the pandemic, there is this great program that will help borrowers basically get back on track and qualify for an IDR plan. So this one-time temporary program, it offers special benefits for borrowers that have um, defaulted direct and felt loans and defaulted Perkins loans held by ED. Loans that are not eligible are defaulted Perkins loans not held by ED, defaulted HEAL loans, and loans that go into default after the end of the payment pause. Fresh Start is av available one year after the payment pause ends. So if you were in default at the start of the payment pause, you have one year from the end of the payment pause to enroll in the program. Next, please. So what are some of the benefits of Fresh Start? A borrower will regain access to Title IV or federal student aid funds. Um, they will not be subject to any collections efforts or collection fees. So these, the first five benefits actually are currently being uh, provided to borrowers without applying for a fresh start. So this is, these are benefits that have been um, going on, except I'm sorry for the first one, but right now borrowers that are in default during the payment pause are not being subject to any collection efforts. Um, any withholdings. Um, they also stopped reporting default status in the federal CAVER system. So this is very important for borrowers that are trying to possibly buy a home, um, make some other purchase, but this is a system that's used federally for any type of um, loan. So they've been, they stopped reporting that status and then fresh start won't count as a rehabilitation and borrowers will be eligible to rehabilitate a default federal student loan if they rehabilitated during the pause. Um, defaulted loans are being reported as current rather than in collections to credit reporting agencies. And I, I think most importantly with collection efforts being stopped, it gave those borrowers a, a reprieve, but you do want to enroll in the program to continue that. So once you apply, enroll in Fresh Start, you will have access to IDR plans, which will then in turn give you access to the IDR forgiveness or maybe even a PSLF if you qualify. Um, and then you also qualify for short-term relief for parents and deferment. But again, we want to just be very careful when we do request um, that type of relief because you will be increasing your loan balance. Um, also, another benefit is that you will use a loan's original date of delinquency if you become delinquent or go into default again. So basically, if you get into fresh start and let's say you are not able to keep up with the payments or for some reason or another you do go into default, they won't count your date of delinquency for credit reporting purposes as that date. They will go back to the original date of um, delinquency or default and therefore it's not going to um, reset your seven year timeline. So it's not going to affect your credit. Next, please. So how to apply? So a borrower that is in default and they have a federal loan or most of them are being held, they, they're held by ED and their guarantee agency, that's those are the default um, servicers, is default resolution group. So if the borrower, um, their, guarantee res, their guarantee agency is uh, default resolution, they can go online, go to, there's the um, address, uh, mydebt.ed.gov and log into the account. This is the easiest option. They can call, it will be a, about a 10 minute phone call and a borrower can just tell them that they want to apply for Fresh Start. Um, they will need uh, the information for them from their most federal tax return, but if they can't find it, um, they should still call to get the information or start the process. They can also mail um, uh, or the request as well. And then if a borrower, does, their loans are not held by ED, they will need to contact that guarantee agency to opt in to the program. When they do opt into the program, they will have to choose a repayment plan and it, we are encouraging borrowers to choose an IDR plan, especially with the changes that are going to be made to the IDR plans. There's a, a change that's being made to repay one of the most popular IDR plans, which will lower borrower, borrowers' payments. So again, under the income-driven repayment plan, depending on your income and your balance, you could have a 
payment of zero dollars. So um, we want borrowers, we encourage borrowers to get under that plan and long term, if depending on their balance, they can also qualify for income driven repayment uh, forgiveness. Next, please. So what happens next? After a borrower opts in or requests to get into the Fresh Start program, they will, Ed will transfer their default loans from the guarantee agency to a loan servicer. This process will take four to six weeks. They will return the defaulted loans to in repayment status, and they will remove the record of the default from the credit report. So this program has really great benefits as far as credit reporting. If you really are trying to um, just fix your credit, maybe um, just improve your financially, make a purchase a home, purchase a car, anything. This is a really great opportunity. Um, what if a borrower goes into default again? Um, Ed will use the original will use the loan's original date of delinquency and Fresh Start will not reset how long they are reporting the loans as, as delinquent or default. So it's not going to, if you go into default again, it's not going to start seven years again. Um, it's gonna take into consideration the original date. If a new loan is taken out during or after Fresh Start, that new loan will not be affected. So if you take out a new, you are in Fresh Start and then you take out a new loan um, and let's say you happen to go into delinquency or default on that loan, you won't get the benefits on that loan. Next, please. Um, and then just a reminder, I'm talking about all these uh, forgiveness, these programs, these benefits. So under the California Student Borrower Bill of Rights, um, a, a servicer, so this is a servicer for both federal and private loans, they have to um, help borrowers, basically. They have to work in the best interest of borrowers and it prohibits servicers from engaging in abusive, unfair, or deceptive practices and requires that they work in the best financial interest of borrowers. So this is really important, especially if you're trying to access any of these benefits, if you're calling your servicer to ask about these programs. They have to provide you with the information and the applications for income-driven repayment plans or other forms of federal benefits and protections, whether it's PSLF, whether it's, um, uh, total permanent disability application or an IDR forgiveness, they must provide you this information. Many of these servicers are really um, amp amping up their websites and they're providing this information. Um, like Mojila has a has a, a login where you can check your PSLF status, you can download forms. Some of these servicers have very informative websites, but you should be able to call as well and access that information through a customer service agent. Um, it establishes special protections for military borrowers, those working in public service, older borrowers, and those with disabilities. So they have to train their staff when a, when a borrower that meets one of these criteria, they have to have trained staff to help these borrowers, borrowers specifically access the programs. And very important with the start of repayment coming up, um, the Bill of Rights also protect borrowers, protects borrowers from any negative consequences stemming from a sale assignment, transfer system conversion, or payment made by the borrower to the original student loan servicer. So there were there have been a lot of changes during the payment pause of servicers, and a borrower may start into repayment with a different borrower. We are not sure of the exact date of um. We haven't been given a firm date for uh, payment restart, but again, this is where this is going to impact or help protect borrowers um, because they have to be given sufficient time to um, start repayment. So if their loans were transferred or anything, just it's important, but it's important for the borrower also to be proactive and find out who their servicer is. But um, this is where that comes into play. A borrower can file a complaint with the DFPI, a formal complaint against a servicer, um, asking for information about their, if they want an account history, if they want their PSLF count, if they want to um, know about uh, income-driven repayment or any other type of um, plan. If they have an uh, issue with their credit reporting, we get a lot of complaints where borrowers feel that um, they the credit hasn't been reported properly, um, especially those borrowers that apply for Fresh Start. That's one of the things we want them to be looking at is monitoring their credit to see those changes are taking place correctly. 
Um, and then California is only one of 13 states that has this advanced legislation to strengthen the oversight of servicers and protect borrowers. And that's where my position as well was established to help borrowers and help um, them understand this information. Next, please. Um, one more thing with all the changes going on, all the everything we're hearing about in the news, the start of repayment, the Biden relief, PSLF, um, student loan scammers are still, um, they're still out there. Um, and they are contacting borrowers by phone, email, and mail, and they are offering services, um, paid services to help them access these programs, to help them with consolidation. Consolidation is a big one. A lot of borrowers get confused by the process. Um, consolidation is free. So it is important to know that you can protect yourself, know that there's nothing that a company can do for you that you can't do on your own for free. All these all this information your servicer should be able to give you access to and studentaid.gov has as well all the links, all the um, login sites, so you shouldn't have to pay for any of this. Um, the loan servicers and the federal government do not call the borrowers on the phone three, four times a week. They just do not have the capability of doing that. Um, if you do receive a letter, I know for my own, my son just is new to student loans and we just received um, correspondence in the mail. So I'm, I could see that it is from the Department of Education, but I have also seen that some of the uh, letters that borrowers are getting, they look very, um, uh, they look official. The seal may be the same, but make sure you read the fine print because these are not coming from Department of Education and it'll say that they are not affiliated with the government agency. Never give out login information and do not subscribe to a monthly service offering help. Again, that's one of the big uh, scams that we see is borrowers getting stuck in these subscription programs or paying uh, three, four hundred a month to be to obtain forgiveness when in reality the only one that can do that or the only uh, agency that can do that is Department of Education and then you can file a complaint with us if you have been a victim of fraud. Next please. And then as I said everything is done through the studentaid.gov uh, site and this is it right here it's actually you're doing everything from start to finish here from filling out your FAFSA when you're first applying or when you're in school to paying your student loans applying for consolidation everything is here these are the important FSA links with updated they have updated information and they have very thorough um, FAQs that they update anytime there is a change. So they have uh, fact sheets as well for all the PSLF, the new guidelines for the income driven repayments. So if anyone really wants to get in there or they're working with borrowers and helping borrowers, they can access that information through studentaid.gov. Next, please. And then I believe now I'm handing it over to Katie. Thank you, Selena. That was such great information. And remember, you will receive a copy of this. Um, so you can go ahead and click on any links that you need that, um, that we've talked about today. And before we get to questions, I wanted to share just a few important resources with you. Um, I know that we say it every time, but please subscribe to our Consumer Connection newsletter. It gives continuous updates on all things student loans, as well as other important consumer alerts and upcoming events. At the bottom, you can see a list of our next webinars. Um, please um, subscribe and you can go to this website for all of our events as well. We have a dedicated student loan website for program resources that back on track, you can see it there. Also, please check out our YouTube channel for this recording and a lot of different interesting webinars on a variety of financial topics, including our previous recordings of all of our student loan webinars. Um, make sure you subscribe so you're always in the know about new content. Um, and here are some other important links that you might find useful as well. Again, once you receive a copy of these slides, you can click on any links that you need. And of course, um, here is Selena's contact information as well. Feel free to reach out to her with any student loan related questions, or if you have a question here and you don't feel comfortable asking in front of everyone, you're welcome to contact her. Um, okay, so let's get to some questions. I'm just gonna read from the top. Um, can folks still apply for the PSLF or is there a deadline? 
Yeah, the pro yes, a borrower can apply for PSLF. PSLF has not gone away and it's not um, currently in, in any danger of going away. So if a borrower is, whether they're halfway or just starting out uh, in public service and they have the correct loans, yeah, they, they can still apply. Um, the changes or the 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 current changes that would apply to them or what would apply would be if they have those older fell loans and they want to consolidate or they have um, a mix of loans. So the public service loan forgiveness is still in place. Great. Uh, for public service employees, do the employers need to sign a form every single year verifying employment, even during forbearance? Yes. Yes, because they will be getting forbearance. It covers the, the payment uh, requirement, but you still need to uh, sign for the employment requirement. Is there a phone number to call to actually talk to a live person with help for specific loans? Uh, you can email me, uh, the, I, I, it was just in the previous slide, but a borrower can email me just, and then we can go over what the actual question is. And then I can, if I'm not able to help or access, I can reach out to um, FSA. Typically they want to know, right, if they, uh, if the loans qualify, but I can help them with that. Just go ahead and email me. Okay, great. Um, how do I follow up on my PSLF application? I may not have completed the process back in October, and I believe I only submitted some of the necessary documents and forms. Okay, if you have not received any correspondence from Mohila or from Ed, what I would advise is um, to go ahead and submit a complaint through us. You can, if you have received some correspondence from Mohila, then you know they have the application, but I would go ahead and file a complaint and request a status update on your, um, on your application. And the complaint would be against Mohila and it's um, it, like an inquiry type of complaint, but we still wanna get that documented, get that in writing. So the borrower understands where exactly they're at. Great, thank you. Um, yes, you will receive a recording. It will be emailed to you um, hopefully later today or tomorrow. And again, you can also um, visit our YouTube channel. The next question is, I applied for PSLF waiver last fall and two of my three prior employers were approved, but the third is a 501c3 and it's still pending what can they do to expedite this? Is there anything? It's been a few months. Yeah, the process when it is when a borrower has to submit the W-2s to when the employment, when the employer has not yet had anyone apply for PSLF, the process, they basically have to go through a screening process for employers so they can get approval. So that process, unfortunately, is a like months long process, especially with all the um, intake of new PSLF applications. So uh, at the only time that you can take action or that you'll be able to appeal it was is once you get an answer saying um, whether or not they're approved. But yeah, the, unfortunately for those um, where you have to submit W-2, it is a, a, a probably at least four months wait on that. We have a long, long line of, uh, of pending approvals. Great. Where can consumers actually report student loan scams? Where should they go? They can uh, file a complaint through DFPI through us, and then they can also file a complaint to the CFPB, which is the federal, the Consumer uh, Financial Protection Bureau as well. Then they can do both. Actually, that's better because we want to know who they are, and we do work with CFPB, so we want to get uh, those scammers uh, we want to find out who they are. <laughs> great. And CFPB has a really great and easy to maneuver website as well. Um, if you were not enrolled in an IDR or PSLF at the beginning of the pandemic, but you were working at a 501c3 during forbearance, would that time count towards the PSLF? Yes, you would have to just go back and certify all the way to the the big or the date when you were working so yes great and we have a few more minutes uh so the pause on payments for the past two years still count towards the 10-year payments for pslf correct and okay. it's more like three years so it's over 36 months now 
that count towards PA, as long as you certify the employment for that period. Can a Fresh Start individual have the opportunity to claim the deferred payments since COVID started towards the 120 payment credit? No, they don't. Okay. Um, the next one, I have my PSLF application with Mohila, and I believe I've met the requirements for forgiveness, but then it was on pause due to a lawsuit. Is the lawsuit still ongoing or has it ended? And if it ended, what should I do to ensure that my PSLF is completed and um, my student debt is wiped clear? Well, the, I'm not, there wasn't a lawsuit that affected PSLF. So the debt, the lawsuit that is ongoing is for the Biden, the debt relief. So it's separate than PSLF. So PSLF applications continued despite the, um, the lawsuit. So maybe I'm not sure if um, she's talking about a different lawsuit, but the PSLF application should have been processed accordingly. So again, I would um urge this borrower this uh to file a complaint with us to see exactly where they're at because the the debt relief lawsuit should not have affected the PSLF processing okay and uh, where can we submit the complaint I applied via fax and did not receive a response either okay it's going to be on our if um can we scroll back to the previous page it's on the I believe the is it on there? Yes, dfpi.gov file a complaint. That's the link. So you can do it um, online and you can uh, attach any supporting documentations. But if you just need a account, just I am a, you know, a borrower, I submitted my PSLF application whenever and I would like an update and they will send you, Mohila will send you an update. They have 15 days to respond. Okay, great. And there's a complaint portal where you can actually see where your complaint is in the process. Uh, so that's really helpful as well. If we qualify for PSLF now, but we stop working or start working for a nonprofit, how will it affect us in the future? Well, then you won't have the qualifying employer unless you go work for another nonprofit or a government agency. So, but again, if you take a few years and uh, you have a few years already in PSLF, you can always just resume where you started, where you left off, if you okay. decide to go back, but you do need that qualifying employer. Great, I think we can get through a couple more. I applied for PSLF before the October 31st deadline and did not receive any information either. Again, I would urge the borrower to file a complaint. Okay. Um, if I worked for a public school district or city government office for just a few months, several years ago, um, and now this person has worked for the state for a year, is it worth certifying for those couple months? Depending on where you're at, some people certify every single month. So, I mean, if you're right there and if you're able to get the certification, if it's not, you can, if you can just email somebody, it wouldn't hurt to add to your account, especially if you're really close. I mean, some people are just eager to just get the, get the forgiveness. So, if you can do it, I would say sure. Okay, great. Um, if there's no more questions, and again, feel free to reach out to Selena directly. Um, that concludes our student loan um, update webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope that you found this information useful. I know I have. Um, thank you, Selena, for this great information. Again, please subscribe to our newsletter so you don't miss on any student loan updates for registration information on our next webinar in July. Um, thank you all and take care. Thank you everyone.